rejoice, 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 for this is the day the Lord hath made. Welcome to our 9 o'clock worship service. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and thank you so much for joining us for worship on today. For some who don't understand our purpose and may not understand our prayers, we as a family, in Jesus' name, would like to tell you the reason why we sing. Someone asked, someone asked the question, why do we sing? Why do we sing? When we lift our hands, we lift our hands to Jesus. what do we really mean? What do we really mean? Someone may be wondering, someone may be wondering, when we sing our song, when we sing our song, at times we may, Say glory. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're the reason. Let's say it again. Someone asked. Someone asked the question. Oh, glory. Why do we sing? Why do we sing? When we lift our hands. When we lift our hands to Jesus. Oh, what do we really mean? Someone may be wondering. When we sing our song, when we sing the song, at times we may, at times we may be crying, and nothing's even wrong. Nothing's even wrong. This is the reason why I sing because, I sing because I'm happy. I sing, I sing because I'm free. I don't know why he does it, but his eyes are on. His eyes are oh, that's the reason why that's I sing. Come on, let's say it again. Glory. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason why. You're the reason why I sing. Oh, hallelujah. Say glory. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason, Jesus. You're the reason why I sing. Say glory. Glory, hallelujah. I give the praises to I you. give the praises to you. Oh, hallelujah. Glory, glory hallelujah. You're the reason why. Listen, and when the song is over, and we've all said amen, and your heart just keep on singing, and the song will never end. Listen, and if somebody asked you, was it just for show? Show. Lift your hands and be a witness. And, be a witness. and tell the whole world no. Listen, and when we cross that river, we cross that river to, study war no more, to study war no more, we will sing, we will sing a song to Jesus, the one whom we adore. Come on, C.A. Jenkins, let's take it home. I sing. Because I don't know why he does it, but it's eyes on the sparrow. That's the reason why. Come on, help me say it one more time. Glory. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason why. Jesus, I love you. I want to say glory. Oh, you're the reason, Lord. You're the reason. Say glory. Glory, hallelujah. I give the praises. I give the praises to hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason why. You're the reason why I sing. You're the reason why I sing. You're the reason why I sing. 
You're my melody at midnight, Jesus. You're my song in my storm, Jesus. You're the healing in my heart, Jesus. You're the reason why I sing. I love your name, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. For the rest of my life, Jesus, you will be the reason why I sing. Amen, amen. To God be the glory. Great things God has done, is doing, and promises to do along the way. If you have your word, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6 from a New Living Translation. And in so doing, I invite you to read the entire chapter this week as it will serve as the background and the context for another part of our sermons. We're preaching four-part sermons on Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And today we're going to open up the story of Lazarus from John chapter 11. I want to read verses 1 through 6 from a New Living Translation. Let us listen to the word of Almighty God. For a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. And so although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I want to focus in on verse 5 and 6 of this text, for it serves as the backdrop as well as the Genesis point for our preaching time. For the Bible says in verse 5 and 6, So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. For although he loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. And with your encouragement and aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to lift up this text and for a brief moment preach this day on our subject, when love makes you wait. When love makes you wait. I don't know what you would do for a dear friend, but I open up the sermon raising a question. It is, what would you do for a friend? What would you do for a loved one? What would you do for someone you cared for? What would you do to support somebody to succeed? For would you help them or hurt them? Or would you lift them up or tear them down? Would you give them what they want or give them what they need? Would you come to the rescue or would you let them learn a hard lesson even if they fail? What would you do for a friend or what would you do for somebody that you care about. I got to give a quote, y'all, from the book Tough Love, written by Dr. Susan Rice, who simply says her parents told her the only constraints we, we face would be our own ambitions and our effort and skill. In essence, what would you do for somebody that you love? You would encourage them. You would lift them up. You would make them feel as though they are not just important, but they can achieve. Come here, let me get you this Sunday morning because tough love is really one of those things that I want to talk about when it says, what would you do for those that you love? And when love makes you wait, what you saying, Reverend? When I've already called her name, 
name that is uh, Dr. Susan Rice. Dr. Susan Rice, a United States ambassador. Dr. Susan Rice, a uh, national security advisor. Dr. Susan Rice, who was on both the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. She comes, y'all, as a descendant of a slave from South Carolina, a slave, y'all, who did not let slavery keep him down, but it was a motivation out of love to make things better. What did her great-grandfather do? He started, y'all, the Bordentown School in New Jersey. What is the Bordentown School? It was considered the Tuskegee of the North. It was a place, y'all, where students of color could transform their lives and their heart. It was a place, y'all, where foundations were given, where people can be lifted up. It was a place, y'all, that produced none other than the brother of Alex Haley, who was an ambassador to Gambia, produced none other, y'all, than one of the founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, produced none other, y'all, than one of the individuals who invented the golf tee. What could you do when somebody loves you? Her great-granddaddy says, honey, don't ever let your color or your gender stop you. What could you do when you love somebody? You encourage them to all that you, what could you do? You pray for them, you lift them up, and you let them know that God will make a way if you are in God's way. Can I just pause right there and let somebody give God praise for what you are doing in your life and what God is doing in your life right now? You are the type amen in the chat box right there because God is moving things and God is lifting things and God is anointing you in a special way because not only are you waiting, but God makes love happen in the wait process. What you saying, Reverend? I'm saying we learned the lesson from Dr. Susan Rice that as you wait on the Lord, God has a way of working things out. Did I fail to mention that she is the daughter of two college graduates? She is the daughter of somebody who encouraged her to motivate her to be more. She was a three-star athlete from a private school in D.C., a scholar at Stanford, a scholar, a Rose Scholar to Oxford, and this woman who had to deal against sexism and deal against racism did not let her 5-3 frame stop her from being all that God called her to be. Why is that important? Because I got to give a shout out not just to Susan Rice, but her mama who orchestrated the Pell Grant. Anybody got a Pell Grant going to school? Type amen right there. I thank God that this descendant of a slave and her mama was able to help write and orchestrate. I thank God that I am a Pell Grant recipient, but the Pell Grant recipient only happens because it was a process of God's love. What you saying, Reverend? I'm saying when we look at our text today, it is all a process of God's love. The Bible says in verses 1, 2, and 3, a certain man by the name of Lazarus has two and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, are followers of Jesus, and they appear several times in the gospel, but on this occasion there was a problem. A certain man and his sisters were followers and friends of Jesus, but they appear in the gospel several times. But on this occasion, my friends, they run into a problem. They are a friend of Jesus, but they still have problems. They are associated with the gospel, but they still have challenges. They are given their life to the Lord, but they still have to come up the rough side of the mountain. Am I talking to somebody this Sunday morning? Because you can testify that just because you are a friend of Jesus, that don't mean you got friend enemies. Okay, let me say it this way. Just because you love the Lord, that does not mean that everybody loves you. And just because you're doing the right thing does not mean that all times good things come your way. Knowing Jesus had the power to heal, Mary and Martha call on their friend Jesus to come see about the one that he loved. His friend Lazarus was sick. You see, Jesus' public ministry was always surrounded by people who loved him. But it's interesting to know that the Bible says that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were special friends. It was a special place when he could kick up his heels and go to Bethany and hang out at Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We've been talking about Mary and Martha for the last two weeks. You remember the last Sunday? Because that's when we talked about Martha who was in the kitchen trying to make a meal that Jesus didn't ask for. And we did say we came 
careful, y'all, trying to serve the Lord and do things that God does not ask you to do. Look at my body language. Be careful when you try to jump in front of God and play God. God can take care of your life and all the things around you without your help. God can do it because that's just the omnipotence and the omnipresence and the omnipower of all mighty God. Mary, Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to come take care of their brother. The Bible says that Lazarus was sick. Now understand this, y'all, is that Jesus gets the message. When he received the message, the Bible says in verse 4, he vowed that the sickness would not end in death, but would end to the glory of God. Let me back it up and say it again. Jesus gets the message that his friend was sick, but he says that the sickness will not end in death, but done for the glory of God. Now, what's important about this understanding to break down the text so you can get a better, fuller, fuller grasp upon it is that this was a case of sickness that was done for the glory of God. This is not the first time we've seen this because the Bible tells us of a story of a blind man and the people raised the question, is the man blind because of what sin happened in his life or his parents happened in their life? But Jesus says, know the blindness of this man was done for the glory of God, which means is that I've got to work through this problem so you can see my glory. Let me back it up and say it this way. You've got to acknowledge the fact, y'all, that the glory of God comes not because you are blessed in a house or blessed with a car or blessed with clothes. No, if you've got good credit, you can get a car. If you've got decent credit, you can get a house. But the glory of God is elevated, y'all, when you've got some trouble and people who don't know God see how God gets you out of that trouble. The glory of God comes, y'all, when you've got a problem and everybody around you say give up and die but like Job you say naked I came into the world naked I shall leave but blessed be the name of the Lord the glory of God comes not because you are able to get up and run and shout the glory of God comes when you're on your sick bed and they give up on you and somehow someway God speaks a word of healing in your life and those who don't believe come on help me preach right there the glory of God comes because because God makes a way out of no way. And there's got to be somebody watching right now who can type, that's my testimony, Reverend. That's my story. That's my shout. Because God can make a way out of no way. If God can heal you, you ought to type amen. If God can deliver you, you ought to type amen. If God has answered a prayer that only God can answer, you ought to type amen. Because that's the kind of glory that God wants to receive. The good news, the good news, y'all, is that we have to realize is that though Jesus denied the prayer of Mary and Martha, it was a delay, but it was not a denial. Let me back it up and say that again. Though Jesus did not come when Mary and Martha asked, it was a delay, but it was not a denial of their request. And somebody's shout is right there. You've been praying, you've been seeking, you've been asking, you've been, been, been petitioning to the Lord, and you are experiencing a delay. But I want you to know your delay is not a denial. A delay is not a denial, but it is a time that prepares you for God's promise. You see, it's important for us to realize as people of God, as we find ourselves in a pandemic, we are praying that God will give us a cure. But that delay is not a denial. The cure is on the way. The healing is on the way. Getting back to what you want to do is on the way. But in the meantime, you have to understand the promises of Almighty God. And the promises of Almighty God always prevail over the problems. Let me say that again. The promises of God always prevail and supersede the problem. The Bible says that I will be with you. I will not forsake you. I will provide for you. I will give healing for you. The Bible gives us promises and what we must do y'all in this time is hold fast to God's promises. When we hold fast to God's promises that means we understand the plan and the purpose and I don't want you to miss 
miss this in the text, y'all, because the Bible tells us crystal clear is that Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says, I will get to Bethany, I will get to Lazarus, but I will get there because there is a greater plan and a purpose in his dying. Okay. The Bible says that Jesus tells the disciples that Lazarus is not dead, he is asleep. And many times I've questioned that minister, Donna, to the point to say, why would Jesus say that he is asleep when he's really dead? But was Jesus playing tricks with the disciples? Was he messing with their mind? But you see, what Jesus had to do, y'all, was to let them know, in your eyes, it is death. But in my eyes, it's just asleep. Let me back it up and say that again, Sister Joy. It's important for us to recognize that in our eyes, things are dead. But in the eyes of Almighty God, they're just asleep. And what we have to do with the power of God on our side is to recognize that in God's eyes, what is what we see in our eyes, what we see is dead. In God's eyes, is simply asleep. God has the power to wake up some things in our lives that are dead, and God says they're just asleep. God has the power to reignite some energy in our spirits that we consider dead, and God said it's just asleep. God has a way of putting those jumper cables from heaven on the positive and the negative of the batteries of our life and give us a boops and every now and then all we got to do now is as we used to turn the key over now just push the button when we push that button God has a way of connecting us to the when we push that button God has a way of reigniting our when we could you help me push the button this Sunday morning somebody needs to push the button on your life push the button on your marriage push the button on your children, push the button on those around you, push the button on your prayer life, push the button on your worship life, push the button wherever. A delay, y'all, is not a denial. Oh, it's so important for us to recognize, y'all, that Lazarus' sickness, Lazarus' sickness did not come as a punishment. It was not a sign of rebellion, but rather it had a spiritual purpose. And I think I'm speaking to somebody today who may find yourself in a Lazarus situation where your family and friends are saying, come and see about me. And you are wondering, will you get out of this thing? But I want you to hold on to the purpose that God has in your life. You see, love will make you wait because there is a plan and a purpose for your life. Love will make me wait because I got to see a greater purpose of my life. My child challenges are going to make me more creative. My struggle is going to build my spirit. My pain is going to reveal more of my purpose. And what the Bible teaches us, y'all, is we have to learn to trust God even when life doesn't make sense. Trust God even when life doesn't make sense. Why? Because there is a purpose in what you are going through. Trust God when it doesn't make sense. There's a purpose in what I'm going through. Trust God when, I, when it doesn't make sense that even though I've been praying for a day and for a week and for a month, even for years, you've got to still trust God because I just simply believe that God will make a way out of no way. You see, I've got to trust God that God will answer prayer. Trust God when I read the word, it gives me comfort. Trust God when I pray without ceasing that somebody who does not believe or raise a question why you keep on praying why you keep on believing and you don't know that your praying your prayer life is the example that God needs that person to see you see it's very hard when we cannot see God in action but that doesn't mean that God isn't acting on our behalf it's hard it's hard sometimes we don't see God but that don't mean God is not acting. It's hard sometimes and we don't see God. I, I, I know that we're in the end of the summer and I do know that what summer brings, what spring brings, spring brings us rain and beautiful flowers and summer brings us the crops that we plant in the ground and somebody right now can testify that you, 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 you have been a, been a recipient of somebody's hard work in the spring and somebody's tilling the soil in the early summer and now you have fresh vegetables. You 
you can see the squash, you can see the zucchini, you can see the melons, you can see the tomatoes now, but you didn't see them in the spring. You see, it happened because that's how God works. You see, you have to recognize that God allows us to plant the seed, but if we don't plant the seed, we won't get the harvest. Let me say it again. God encourages us to plant the seed of faith, and God gives the sun and the rain. And when God gives the sun and the rain, there is a fruit from your harvest. When God works in one's life, God has a way of helping you plant that seed. And that seed is a part of the process. The process that Mary and Martha had to recognize is that though their brother was dying, and by the time Jesus got there, had been dead four days, it was not necessary for Jesus to come and resurrect Lazarus. What was important for them to resurrect their faith, because Jesus was going to bring Lazarus back to life. That's one story. But Mary and Martha, you got to tell the story that when God resurrects Jesus, that's even more important than my brother coming back to life. Because Jesus being resurrected wasn't because Jesus came to resurrect Jesus, but God came down to resurrect God's only. Let me just help you understand this, because it's important for us to recognize that our trials and tribulations that we go through are really there so we can lean more on God. We can can trust in God's time and we can strengthen our faith. When we lean more on God, that means that we have to understand is that when love makes us wait, I've got to let some other folk go. Okay. When I lean more on God, that means I'm leaning less on you. And meaning less on you means I'm more dependent on God. And being more dependent on God means I'm going to follow God's word. When I follow God's word, I'm going to yield to God's will. When I follow God's will, I'm going to let God pay the bill. Ooh, I said something good. Here you go. When I follow what God is doing and doing what God is saying, that means I'm less dependent upon you. The word says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy understanding. Acknowledge God in all thy ways and God will direct your path. When I'm leaning on God, I'm dependent on the word. When I'm leaning on God, I'm faithful to God's doing. When I'm leaning on, okay, okay, okay. You've got to recognize recognize that leaning on God means I'm trusting in God's timing and trusting in God's timing I'm gonna let God take control and when I let God take control that means I've got to let go and let God you see for the word tells us in Jeremiah what for I know the plans I have for you the plans to prosper you not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future I know the plans that I have for you. I like the way Albert Einstein says it. He talks about imagination. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attraction. Imagination, it is everything. I've got to let God work with my imagination. Come on, temptation. It was just my imagination running away with me. Okay, okay, that's too much, too much, too much on a Sunday morning. But the imagination that you and me can get together, the imagination that we will have a family of three to imagine. Come on, temptations. You know you got to have an imagination. But I like the way that Albert Einstein says it. It is the preview of coming attractions, the preview of coming. What is the preview? We hadn't been to the movies in a long time, but when we did go to the movies, you do know what happened. They have previews of coming attractions. Now, what happened, y'all, is that the previews of coming attractions used to be called trailers. Matter of fact, they're called trailers now. Now, how can it be called a trailer and necessarily be called a preview? Well, in the old school, they used to put the trailers at the end of the movie, but you know what it is when the movie's over, you grab your your popcorn that you have not eaten, that icy that you have not drank, and you leave the theater. But what the Hollywood said, in order for you to see what's coming, we have to put the preview in front of the main attraction. Okay, the preview comes before the main movie. You paid for the movie, but you get a bonus with the preview. 
You have paid good money for the movie you want to see, but somehow, someway, Hollywood teases you with a preview of coming attraction. And the good news, y'all, when you look at COVID-19, this pandemic, we've been in home for about six, seven, eight months now. We've been on lockdown, y'all. We've been asked to spend more time with family, more time in the Word, more time at home away from stuff. We have been told not to buy stuff we can't afford to impress folk we don't like because they can't see it. How are you going to buy something new with an $800 bag and walk from the bathroom to the kitchen? How are you going to buy some red bottom shoes to show off your people? In your no, no, no. Don't be trying to impress the male lady, the male man. It's a pre- Okay, let me get back. A preview of coming attraction simply means, my friends, is that you have to recognize that God has you in a process right now. This is just the beginning of what God is about to do in your life. When I learn to wait and let God make me wait in love, I will have the fortitude and the spirit that when I get out to let somebody know, look what God has done, you are simply going to go on what the preview, or what was the preview? I'm not spending more time with God in the word. I'm not spending more time on my knees. I'm not spending more time with my family. The preview of coming attractions. Now the good news is that after the preview and the main movie come on, that's when the shout comes. That's when the joy comes. You see, you've got to recognize also, y'all, is that everything we have is in somebody's imagination. Steve Harvey said it so well. He said the things we have been in, the things that, that have been in your imagination, you must start working on them. These are the gifts that God has given you. Your cell phone was in somebody's imagination. Your computer is a computer because somebody had imagined it. Your, your, your widescreen TV is there because somebody had imagined it. An automobile was an imagination. Folk got tired of riding horse and buggy, riding behind a mule, riding behind a donkey, and now it's, a, it's part of an imagination. The good news, y'all, is that you have to stop telling your big dreams to small people. You got a big imagination. Quit wasting your smartphone on dumb people. You've got to recognize that when I when love makes me wait, love is not going to say I'm going to jump at the first thing that's smoking, the first thing that's coming. I've got an imagination given by Almighty God, and I'm going to fulfill what God calls me to do. Here it is from Muhammad Ali. If the mind can conceive it and the heart can believe it, then I shall achieve it. What was he saying? This is a prize fighter who changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali because of the, of, the, of the stance against the war in Vietnam. This was a prize fighter that was stripped of his, of, of his, of his belt, y'all, because he took a stance. You see, Colin, Colin Kaepernick is not the first person that stood up for justice. It was also Brother Floyd who gave up his, uh, his, his baseball career because he took a stance against the baseball owners, y'all, back in the 60s. It was people uh, like Muhammad like, 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 uh, Muhammad Ali, y'all, who recognized I've got to conceive it here, believe it here. Why? Because I can achieve it over there. You see, it's important for us to recognize, again, God will delay delivery so that our behavior will line up with our belief. God will delay delivery so that our behavior will line up with our belief. Okay, you're not getting it, so let me break it down and give it to you in a country illustration, because y'all know I'm from the country, proud of the country. Country. I live in the suburbs of Kannapolis. That is the un, unincorporated part of the big city. So in, in the suburbs, we learned some things about waiting. And I remember Dr. Monroe back in the day that my mama said she was going to make a pound cake. Now I'm talking about one of those lemon pound cakes that does melt in your mouth. I'm talking about one that you want to get and, and, and eat even to the point of licking up the batter when she's making the pound cake. That was just exciting as the cake. But I came home y'all and I was waiting for mama to make the cake and I didn't see no cake didn't smell no cake 
I saw eggs sitting out on the counter. I saw butter sitting out on the counter. I didn't smell no cake. I was like, Mama, when you gonna bake the cake? And she said, Son, we can't bake the cake. We have to wait until the ingredients get ready. I said, Mama, I'm waiting for the cake. She says, Son, if you learn to wait, you will benefit in your weight. She says to me, in essence, that love makes you wait. If you want some pound cake that you love, you're gonna have to wait on it. I said, Well, Mama, all I see is eggs getting room temperature and butter melting. And Mama helped me understand that, Son, when the eggs get right and the butter gets right, then we're gonna have the cake. Can I talk to somebody this morning? Because you're hungry, you're salivating at the mouth right now. You're thinking about a lemon pound cake with some white icing on it. But the truth of the matter is, is that you cannot make the cake that's going to taste like something unless you wait. You cannot have an ingredient that's going to develop into something you're going to appreciate unless you wait. Can I help you shout this Sunday morning? Because God has you in a waiting process right now. Because God loves you and God cares for you. And because God cares for you so much, that's why God, okay, can I talk about Lazarus? Because Lazarus is dead by the time Jesus gets there. Lazarus has no life in him by the time Jesus arrives. Jesus says that the death of Lazarus is done for the glory of God. And I've already made an allusion to that to you, y'all, because your going through helps somebody get to a relationship with the Lord. It was death in the eyes of the disciples and Mary and Martha. It was sleep in the eyes of Almighty God. It was only in the waiting process that Jesus says, I've got to let this happen. Your time is not my time. Your agenda is not my agenda. What you are going through only helps you get to. And somebody looking at me this Sunday morning, I want you to be affirmed and confirmed that what you're going through, God has God's hands on you. What you are experiencing now, God knows what's going to be in the future. What you are have to lift up now, God gives you strength to go through all that you are going through. Why? For the glory of Almighty God. God's glory, God's glory. That, that, that's the one thing I want to say first is that when, when events don't go as we think they should, God has a better time and a better place. When things don't go as we should, God has a better time. Better. How can you say that, Reverend? Here's what happens. Three things happen. When you believe that God is in charge, your belief will determine your behavior, and your behavior will help you become. Love will make you wait because God is saying, I need you to believe in me and the things that are happening now. Because in the future, I want you to behave as though you believe with me in the pandemic. Nobody knew it would come upon us this time last year. So whatever you were believing then, I pray you are believing harder and faster now because your behavior now is a reflection on what you believe and your behavior is a determinant on what you become. You see, we should not let the news of Lazarus dying disassociate or say, dis, or to say that disconnect us from our praise and worship. You should not let the death of family and friends, the death of ideas, the death of spirits, the death of all those things around you disconnect you from your praise to Almighty God. We've got to recognize that what we believe determines how we behave and how we behave leads to what we become. Now, the last thing I want to say is God's perspective is eternal and not temporal. God's perspective is eternal. God is saying through Jesus Christ, what Lazarus is going through now, I will raise him up. Martha says, yes, Lord, as a good Jewish person, I know in the resurrection we will be raised with you. But Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the one that you should praise and worship. I am the one that gives life. Don't you fret. Don't you, don't, don't, don't you get weary. Don't, don't you lose hope. I, I am the one that is, that is here for you. I'm the resurrection in your presence. Martha, Mary, don't you weep because I'm here in front of you right now to lift up the presence of God that makes a difference. 
Oh, but love makes you wait. Love makes you wait. It has a way of revealing, revealing to you, y'all, uh, a, a special blessing, special blessing. I want to close with a story that maybe some of you are familiar with, but a story, I think, that speaks about the presence of being in the arms of Almighty God. A young man was about ready to graduate some years ago from college, and for many months, he had admired a special sports car down at the local car dealer, so much so he would go by on a weekly basis and look at it then he would say even to his father who was very wealthy father when I graduate from college I would like to get that sports car so on graduation day the young man went to visit his father and the father invited him to his private study and he sat down and he said son I'm so proud of you you have accomplished things you have you have excelled in school and I want to give you a gift and there was a box y'all wrapped up all nice and in that box, y'all, the young man opened it up, and to his surprise and some dismay was a Bible. A Bible was wrapped in a box. Now, he looked at the Bible, and he looked at his daddy, and he was expecting the keys to an automobile, but he got a Bible. When he got this Bible, he unfortunately slammed it down on the desk, and he talked back, raising his voice at his daddy, how could you, with all of your wealth and all of your money and all of the desires I've expressed to you, give me a Bible? Bible on graduation day. He left with anger in his heart and in his spirit, never to speak to his daddy anymore. He went on, y'all, and was a successful businessman, had a wonderful family and children, and he moved so far away from his father, he was not connected to him. And one day, he realized that he wanted to go back and make amends with his father for his attitude and his actions. But as he prepared to go visit his father, he got a telegram informing him that his father had passed and his father had passed leaving all of his wealth to his son now here's where the story gets interesting the young man now realizing that he has to go back to execute the will of his father goes into his father's house goes into the study and when he's in the study y'all he Box, the box that is wrapped up and the box that has the Bible inside of it. Tears begin to fall down his eyes and he remembered that the last time he saw that Bible was the last time he talked to his daddy. The last time that he communicated with his father was over that Bible. And he could not help but to open up the Bible. And as he opened up the Bible, y'all, he saw that his father had underlined, y'all, some scriptures from Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And the scripture says, and if being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father, which is in heaven, give those to ask of him? The Bible, y'all, was underlined Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And also, as he read that portion of the Bible, he looked in the Bible, and there were car keys in the back of the Bible. There was a tag with the car keys with the dealer's name, and on the end of the tag, it said, paid in full. What do you do when folk that you love, and you have to make them wait? What is it that, that, that you're trying to encourage? Well, I believe in the words of Vicki Wine, and she says, but the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we hear that words that we are safe in the arms of Almighty God, we will recognize that waiting upon God helps us gain our strength. When we're able to move a little bit closer, you see, there's a song to which we're hearing now of our musicians sing, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. It is the understanding that God has a way of helping us in those moments when we wait, in those moments of delay, in those moments of, of doubt, even in those times when we're trying to figure things out. Remember this, y'all, that God has a plan and God has a purpose. And that plan and purpose cannot be rushed. You get restoration as you wait upon the Lord. You get inspiration as you follow God's will. Most importantly, you get the comfort that you get to affirmation of your salvation. And that is my invitation to you this Sunday morning that somebody who may find yourself in a waiting process, somebody who may find yourself 
going through and still asking God, when will it happen? I want you to be affirming the love of Almighty God because that love will get you through. That love lifts you up. That love makes so it's a It's been a joy to be in worship with you. I thank you for joining. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for being a part of our virtual worship service. Uh, it is a great place to grow in the Lord that is here at C.N. Jenkins. And so wherever you are all over the world, I want you to make sure that God, 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 it stays the center of your life and the center of your joy. Do you be sure to call us. Be sure to email us. Let us know how you uh, receive this word, receive this message. Share it with somebody. That's so important. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to pray for our neighbors and pray for those around us. To our college students, thank you for, for being who you are. For our students going back to school here in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, prayer to you. Teachers, you know, we love you, praying for you. To all of those in the educational process, you are important to us. Now, as I always say to the students, you are on the honor roll right now. Your pastor says, stay there. Don't get off. I want to celebrate you at the end of the year. God loves you. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week.